Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our monthly book talk at the National Museum of the U.S. Army at Fort Belvoir, Virginia. And uh, tonight we have The Other Face of Battle, America's Forgotten Wars and the Experience of Combat. I'd like to thank everyone who is with us tonight and participating in our four panelists who are the authors. Uh, we have with us tonight Wayne Lee, uh, Tony Carlson, David Preston, and David Silby. And we're very uh, honored that you all uh, have, just have uh, made time in your schedules to talk to us about your book and get folks interested in it. So uh, a very good evening to all of you. Thanks, John. Thank you. Good evening. So let me uh, uh, make sure folks know uh, who our authors are. Uh, first is Wayne Lee, is the Bruce Carney Distinguished Professor of History at the University of North Carolina. Uh, Anthony Carlson is Associate Professor of History at the U.S. Army School of Advanced Military Studies. Uh, David Preston is the General Mark W. Clark Distinguished Professor of History at the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina. And last but not least, David Silby is Associate Director of Cornell in Washington and Adjunct Associate Professor Cornell History Department. And again, welcome uh, welcome to our panelists tonight who have co-authored this book. So uh, why don't we start out with a question about the overall framework and the idea for the book. And uh, Wayne, maybe you can start us out. Where did this idea come from? And um, the title is The Other Face of Battle. And uh, how does that come from the face of battle? Can you give us some background on that? Sure, of course. Um, I think many people in your audience and certainly many people in our, our intended audience understood the reference immediately to Keegan's uh, The Face of Battle, which was a classic argument uh, about the way battles should be described. It was published in the mid seventies. And the argument was that battles here to, prior to his work were all too often described in metaphorical terms or in ways that focused on the decisions of generals and ignored the ways in which the outcome really depended on the, the psyche of the men and women involved. And he tried to propose a new way of thinking about battle and a new way of describing battle to truly get into the minds of individual soldiers. And the idea, the genesis of this book was to take that insight and try to apply it to a more uh, complex circumstance because Keegan's three examples, and we of course deliberately use three examples in, in, in sort of homage, but also simplicity's sake, uh, in reference to his three examples, but all of his examples were very, not just within Western history, but within a very specific set of circumstances. Um, there, the, if those of you who have not read it, uh, obviously immediately you should read it and then read our book. Uh, but then the battles of Agincourt, uh, Battle of Waterloo, and, and then the Somme. And what is true about all three of those battles is their enormous cultural and historical significance. They're iconic battles. And they're also fought against the French, the French, and the Germans which is a very limiting cultural sphere and essentially in one sense limits the variables that are in play. The, the two combatants in every case were fighting with exactly the same technology and more or less the same systems of conscription of mobilization uh, of governmental or, or cultural propaganda, uh, their view and definitions of what war were and definitions of victory were all identical. And in one sense, that's great because that means that Keegan didn't have to consider all of those variables. But the idea that I had many years ago was to try to, to increase the number of variables to analyze intercultural conflict. Um, and in my original notion, I was gonna do this on my own. I wanted to do battles from world history across centuries of time. And I just realized over several things I realized fairly quickly is that there was too much time and too many places to come up with three examples that could adequately cover anything. Um, and also one of the things we say in the preface is that you need to know too much 
you need to be an expert to, to dive down to this level of detail in terms of individual soldiers' experiences and how those experiences reflect the cultures in which they live requires a level of expertise that would be a lot to put on a single author. And so I started reaching out to people whose expertise I thought I could draw on for, for the three examples that I thought in American history might work so that we try to, at least one sense, we tried to remove at least one variable from the equation. We still do have one basic nation state as one of the players. And so that we could tell that nation state's history as a moving story that in which all these battles then fit. Um, and even in my original conception, Monongahela was one of the ones that I wanted to include. And so when David Preston's, we're gonna have to constantly say David Witch uh, in, over the course of this talk, since we have two Davids. But when David Preston's book on Monongahela came out, it was a natural uh, no brainer to reach out to him uh, to provide that kind of expertise. And again, depth to the study of Monongahela. Um, and I knew David Silby from years ago, and I knew about his work on the Philippines. And then I went hunting for someone who was doing this kind of detailed work on soldiers' experience in Afghanistan, and was fortunate to find Tony to provide that case study. I just want to highlight something that Wayne said about uh, Keegan's uh, focus on the battles that were really important in British history. To, to One of the things that attracted me to this was that America likes the battles that we like. We love Gettysburg and Bunker Hill and Pearl Harbor and Midway and all of the sort of traditional battles of what we think of as real war. And yet when you look at American military history, we're actually fighting wars and battles in places that no one remembers and no one thinks about. And this was really a chance to start saying, hey, what is... What does it mean when most of our time is spent in places like the the deep woods frontier or in the Philippines or in Afghanistan, not in the, the sort of battles that movies get made about, but in the battles that actually define American military history in a lot of ways? David Preston. Hello, everyone. Uh, I, I'll just tag these thoughts on to uh, David and Wayne's comments. I think that each of these, these uh, case studies that we have, they, they illustrate in part the subtitle of our, our book, that these are, are forgotten wars. And whereas Keegan's three battles were, were well known to, to, um, to most British people, um, the, the, the case studies that we chose are relatively unknown. And that's the point, is that these battles, um, like, like many irregular conflicts at large, are often forgotten. And each of the case studies say something very different. In the case of, of Braddock's defeat, you have a conventional army that relied on conventional methods and yet was destroyed by a much smaller irregular force. At Manila in 1899, we have an army that, that came to the Philippines with, with a great degree of experience by virtue of the Plains Indian Wars in confronting irregulars. And yet that army, even though it won a conventional triumph at Manila, it, it faced in the aftermath, uh, uh, an insurgency of many years. And much the same can be said of, of the American army at Mac one in 2010. This is arguably the most professional force that we're looking at in these three case studies. And this professional force with, with so many advantages was unable to translate those advantages into a, a strategic outcome that was desired. Thank you. Are you waving at us again, David, or are you just adjusting your camera? Just adjusting my camera, sorry. Okay. All right, so uh, a question for you of, of, the, of the three battles, the Monongahela, uh, Manila, and Maquan, in, uh, of those three, were when you were looking for 
examples to use? What was it? Was it kind of all over the board, or you kind of knew in advance uh, which three? And and was were the choices limited to some degree by uh, the availability of documentary evidence? Yeah, that's a great question, John. And of course, I want to point out that you rattling off the three names reminded me again that you, the fact that they all start with M is a total coincidence. Um, I, I didn't even register when we were writing the book at a school, until it was much that. later. And I was like, oh my God, they all start with M. People are going to think we did this on purpose. Um, well, like I said, many years ago, I thought about Monongahela as a classic example because, in some ways, it is an iconic battle for Americans in the 18th century. Uh, and through the early 19th century, it's, it's only forgotten later. Um, and Manila is the, especially once the Iraq war started in 2003 and when the insurgency uh, began to heat up in 05, 06, the Manila became one of the touchstones or at least the, the Philippines insurgency, if not the Battle of Manila, the Philippines insurgency became a touchstone as the army and the public started trying to look back to the previous US experience of counterinsurgency. And that's one of the reasons I liked the idea of doing the Battle of Manila, as because David Preston was just saying, is it's a conventional fight against the Filipinos. It starts out, the war starts out as a conventional battle. That's the opening engagement. And that sets a set of expectations, the victory the Americans achieve sets, a set of, sets up a set of expectations for the Americans thinking this is going to be a rollover. The rest of this is going to be easy. Um, and Makwan, uh in, and I'll let, I can let Tony talk about this in detail. One of the reasons that, that Tony sort of heaved up onto my radar screen was because I, I heard that what he was doing already was conducting detailed oral histories. And so he was already doing a very low level detailed uh, investigation of that battle so that it would allow us to do that sort of Keegan-esque uh, style uh, soldier's view uh, uh, narrative. So Tony, you want to if you want to flesh out any of how you got to that? Sure. So, um, you know, I started on this project a long time ago at the Combat Studies Institute, working for the Army as a historian, and uh, I was working on a team of historians that had been hired at the time by General Petraeus when he was the commander of the International Security Assistance Force to conduct interviews with soldiers returning from theater so that we could capture their stories and write tactical level vignettes that could then be distributed to company grade officers, platoon leaders, NCOs that they could read on their way over to theater to prepare them for the types of combat experiences that they were going to encounter <clears throat> upon arriving in theater. Um, and very, uh, Right away, I became very interested, of course, not just in the experiences and stories of these soldiers, but also the high degree of asymmetry, which is also a very big theme within our book. Um, and in particular, the operation that Maquan is a part of, Operation Dragon Strike, actually ends up at the time of the second Afghan surge during the war in Afghanistan, largest US Army operation of the entire war. And it quickly morphs into an operation that is very conventional, relying on, I would say, Cold War tactics to breach minefields, to deal, to breach through a lot of these IED belts in one of the most difficult terrains, I think, that the Army has fought, certainly since Vietnam, and maybe going back to Bukaj in 1944. But between the physical environment, the high degree of asymmetry, the fact that this was operation took on a very conventional nature in the midst of fighting a very unconventional unconventional and non-state actor. I thought when I was trying to sell this particular um, operation to Wayne really fit well within the narrative framework and structure of what he was trying to do in terms of both a symmetrical intercultural warfare that really drew on the visceral experience of combat at the soldier's eye level. David Selby. Yeah, and, and I, I wanted to highlight two things from what both Wayne and, and Tony said. One, one of the things about this is that there's an assumption when you start looking at, bat, at wars and battles that aren't the ones we think about. You think about asymmetry. You think about the giant American economy and military against a much smaller foe. But one of the interesting things about the Battle of Manila 
is it's actually a very symmetrical battle. The two armies are about the same size. They, they're roughly equipped in the same way. And so it's actually a much different situation where it's not asymmetrical, but it's actually intercultural in the sense that neither side, especially Americans, really understood that they were fighting uh, an enemy who was of about equal quality or equal caliber. They were they were non-white, so they they weren't the same level of of fighting. And then on, just on a sort of a, a note as a as a scholar and a professor, the stuff that Anthony was coming up with was just amazing. I mean, some of the stories that folks were telling and some of the stuff that he had coming in. And then just the ability to reach back to people and get sort of, oh, what did you mean by this was just some of the amazing stuff. It, I, I mean, in, in some ways it made me sort of try to step up my game as much as I could because he's coming up with this great stuff. And I'm suddenly like, yeah, I got a, I got a you know, report from a general on this point. And, and he's just got this amazing stuff on what's going on in Afghanistan. Yeah, John, if I can, if I can jump in just a, real quick to follow sure. up on something David said, that it really is crucial. A, a lot of people looked at this book and they, their first rea reaction to it or their knee-jerk reaction to it is, is that it's about asymmetry, that it's about a conventional power against an irregular power, whether tactical or strategic. Uh, and one of our points was, first of all, to mix that up so that you have conventional, conventional. And then as Tony was saying, that there's conventional tactical aspects to the way the, the fight at Mach 1 takes place, but it's within a strategic asymmetry context. But the real thread, the, the red thread that runs through the whole book is the intercultural piece, where the, the two sides experience a battle in the Keegan-esque sense, their, their psychic and moral experience of combat is profoundly shaped differently because of the intercultural quality, because they're not seeing the enemy they expect because the enemy is doing things that they don't expect down to the sensory inputs, the, the sounds that they hear, the things that they smell, uh, all, of the, all of the ways in which societies and cultures differ, all of those things then appear on the battlefield in a heightened format. And then they, those things then have, those dissonances then have tactical implications and ultimately strategic implications. And so we wanted to explore all of those things because all of the case studies share without doubt is the intercultural quality, but they don't necessarily share that what, what many people assume is an asymmetrical quality. Uh, and, but those experiences that we are trying to convey are, are very much shaped by the intercultural nature. So David Preston, uh, the Monongahela, uh, if you would, and, and your co-authors can jump in after you, of course, uh, can you tell us a brief overview of the battle and uh, kind of where it fits in with the overall theme of the book? And one comment I, I would make that I was really struck by by all the chapters is that is this notion of a, a, a different definition of victory and that the the uh, Native Americans and the Monongahela, uh, in your example, uh, they didn't necessarily have to win every battle or, or win the battle completely like a set piece European affair in order to, to think that they had won. And then I remember the same thing in the Maquan uh, struggle too, that, that the, the, our enemy could also claim victory by being able to survive. Um, and I think that was really true on the Monongahela too, but why don't you give us a little uh, overview of the battle and, and, and your thoughts to start with on, on, uh, on the thesis. Sure. The destruction of General Braddock's army at the Monongahela on July 9th, 1755, in many respects, it's, it's kind of like a parable for any military force that thinks it stands to take heed lest it fall. And I think that that was the, the quintessential lesson of Braddock's defeat for the generation of, of the, the generations of the 18th century, um, well into the, the 19th century, as, as Wayne Lee said. It was a, a classic example of a conventional force that 
met with catastrophic defeat at the hands of an irregular opponent, a smaller irregular opponent that didn't have nearly as much firepower. And to give you a sense of the, uh, the, the scale of the destruction here, consider that in the space of four hours on the afternoon of Jul July 9th, 1755, two out of every three British soldiers who crossed the Monongahela were killed or wounded. Very, very few taken as prisoners. And it was a, a defeat that, that truly shocked the, the entire British world. Uh, there are references to um, uh, comparisons, I should say, of, of Braddock's defeat to uh, the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest in AD 9, which um, three Roman legions were, were similarly destroyed in catastrophic fashion by Germanic tribesmen. And the Monongahela is, is such a, a, a classic example of, of what we're getting at in, in the book, which is the, uh, the, the strangeness and the, the terrifying and jarring nature of intercultural combat. And I'd, I'd just like to read one, one uh, quote from my, the, the, the book that, um, that comes from a British report after the, the battle in which um, this, this, uh, this official stated that the novelty of such fighting from the French and the Indians struck our troops with amazement and terror and they found themselves destroyed by an invisible enemy. So at the Monongahela, you have a, a conventional force that confronts an opponent that is, is completely mystifying. And there's, there's really nothing in the, the training, the previous experience of these British regulars to, to give them any type of, of mechanism for how to respond to this, this terrifying and, and extremely mobile native and French force. And it, it really begins with, with um, you know, I, I try to uh, place the, the reader in, in the context of the, of the British column and consider that for these British soldiers, they, they feel as though they're on the cusp of victory. And that's part of the, um, the, the jarring nature of the clash is that it's so unexpected. And that's another one of the themes of, of the book is, is the unexpected nature of, of um, irregular war or intercultural war. And so these British soldiers would have heard firing up at the, the front of the, the column. And in, in very quick fashion, they would have heard the, the sounds of, of probably what sounded to them like thousands of, of native warriors uttering their, their war cries that, that, to, that to them sounded like terrifying. And, and they even used the word murderous to describe these, these, uh, these war cries. And that was one of the ways that the natives disarmed their opponents even before the battle began. And then in, in just an astonishingly rapid fashion, native warriors completely flanked the, uh, the British column. They drove in the, the flanking protection that General Braddock had placed. About one third of his, his total force was deployed as flankers to protect the column. The natives destroyed those, those flanking parties and very quickly drove for the, the rear of the, of the column, again, to sow panic and confusion. And then uh, they found themselves essentially surrounded by an invisible enemy. And it, it, it's really amazing that the, the British accounts of the battle describe how many British soldiers never even saw an opponent the invisible enemy that that, that, that report referred to. Uh, so imagine how, how terrifying it must have been to be surrounded just by piles of white smoke and to see these, these muz muzzle flashes. And then this, this is a, a constant fire that's, that's being maintained upon the British column by the, the French and the Indians. There's no volleys that they're experiencing. It, it's, it's a continuous volume of, of fire. And to make matters even more terrifying and disconcerting, 
the, the British rank and file find that their officers are being disproportionately targeted by native marksmen. And they're watching these, these leaders that are supposed to demonstrate the song flood of, of battle fall right before them. And I think the natives knew enough about, about 18th century European or French armies to understand that the, the officers were really the key to uh, the, the command and control. And without the officers, those rank and file soldiers were utterly helpless because they were not trained to be, to be disciplined in the modern sense of the word of, of displaying initiative in battle. They were taught only to obey the commands of their, their officers. And so this, uh, this whole battle to summarize, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it, it's almost like watching 18th century British society just dissolve over the course of this, of this battle. And it becomes a, a case of every man for himself. So I'll stop there. I could go on, uh, but I, I wanna save time for Manila and Mac one. All right. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's talk now to David Silby uh, about Manila. And uh, again, a, a kind of a brief overview and, and what you were getting at by including this particular battle as one of the as one of the three chapters the three three th uh, examples yep manila is a manila is a really kind of interesting battle because it's a really conventional battle there's trench systems around the city of manila that have been built up over months there are frontal assaults there are things that look like the civil war there are things that look like world war one and yet we tend to think of it in the same context as this, as a lot of sort of asymmetric and, and non-conventional battles. What happened was that the US sort of ended up in the Philippines at the end of the 19th century. Um, and you know Dewey's famous victory over the Spanish fleet in the Battle of Manila Bay. And then McKinley out of uh, sort of an excess of ambition sends an army out to Manila. And when they get there, they don't quite know what to do. There's Spanish soldiers holding the city of Manila itself. And then there's an army of Filipinos who are besieging uh, the city. And the U.S. doesn't quite want to be friends with the Spanish, but doesn't quite want to be friends with the Filipinos either. And there's this weird standoff until the Spanish surrender and end up going home. And the Americans occupy Manila. And then there's this long standoff between the Filipinos and the Americans. And one of the things about this is they watch each other. They, they look at what each other's doing. And the, the important thing to think about is the Americans look at the Filipinos through a very strong racial lens. They're not white soldiers. They're not white in, natives of a certain area. And so whatever they see in the Filipinos is sort of filtered through that racial sense that they brought home from the United States, from the American South, Jim Crow uh, America. And so whatever valuation they make is based off of that racial sense. But the funny thing is it's also not inaccurate because what they see when they look at these Filipino soldiers is they're not actually very good. They can't shoot straight. They're not very disciplined. They don't train a lot. And so sort of six months later in, in early 1899, when the Americans and Filipinos go to war during a sort of mistaken engagement, the Americans make decisions based on this sense that they're not very good soldiers because they're not white, but they're not wrong about them not being very good soldiers. And so the, the, the Civil War veterans, because a lot of the American officers and generals were Civil War veterans, mounted frontal assaults that would have gotten even Robert E. Lee fired from his position as a, uh, as a commanding general, and they succeed. And so the, the Battle of Manila in, in February of 1899 is this massive American triumph, but it's based on a, an analysis that's, that's, that's basically wrong, a sort of racial analysis. And so the, the U.S. is not ready to deal 
with Filipinos who might actually know what they're doing. And, and when the war turns to an insurgency after the battle, the US doesn't quite know how to react because the Filipinos don't know how to fight because they're not white. And, and how can they be doing, doing this thing? The, the flip side of this, I want I want to also want to highlight is the Filipinos and a lot of other people learn lessons from this battle, which is fighting Western con- armies in a conventional manner, what we call a conventional manner on a battlefield with high technology is not going to work out well for the opponent. Didn't work out well for the Filipinos. Didn't work out well for a whole host of folks trying to fight Americans and British and other Western powers. And so people like Mao Zedong and Che Guevara and folks like that started to learn lessons from this, that if you're going to fight Western industrialized armies, don't fight them in the way they did at Manila. Don't fight them on the battlefield. Figure out another way to do it. Do you, do you find, David, um, one of the things that struck me, um, I'll, I'll just mention this before we go to Tony, one of the things that struck me that was characteristic of all three of the examples was that, um, at least in modern times, when I, and I mean probably 18th century uh, through now, it, it seems like Americans and maybe Europeans also, uh, they don't have a lot of patience for long drawn out struggles. Whereas culturally, which you all were talking about at the beginning, um, mm-hmm. Seems like a lot of times our our enemies uh, play the long game. Uh, you know, uh, Ho Chi Minh comes to mind right away. Is that that and, and same with the uh, Chinese? But you, did you find that with the with the Filipino insurgents that they were they were willing to to kind of hang in there no matter how long it took? Yeah, and it's an interesting. It's a great question because I think one of the things about the United States and about a lot of Western powers is there are certain kinds of wars that we like to fight and they're high technology and they're decisive, unconditional surrender. And they're about finishing things off quickly. And when those wars don't go the way that we want them to, we get frustrated. Now, the the interesting thing is that's not a natural state for our, I don't think for our culture, Because if you look at the 19th century, one of the things about American wars of the 19th century, leaving out the Civil War, is that they they extended for very long periods of time. The the wars against the Native Americans in the American West went went over decades. The, the The repeated wars against Latin American countries spread over, uh, over decades again. And so one of the things that happens after the Philippines is that there's a deliberate choice to move away from the kind of long experience that Americans had in the West towards a more modern, a modern, they thought, um, kind of warfare that would set them up for the, the world wars, World War I and World War II. All of the, the soldiers and generals who had fought in the Philippines and had long experience in the wars against the Native Americans basically retired or were moved out in the first decade of the 20th century when Elihu Elihu Root came in and and Teddy Roosevelt and all of those things. So there's almost a deliberate choice on the part of the Americans to move away from understanding these kind of warfare, this kind of warfare. Tony Carlson, tell us about Maquan and why this one was was the one that uh, I assume you were involved in the choice of it, and Wayne didn't tell you what to write. Uh, but tell, tell us why you uh, sure. this one. Just to maybe set the background a little bit for folks who might be a little more unfamiliar, just based on the more recent nature of this campaign or battle than the other examples, is uh, I would trace this back to obviously the beginning of the war. In 2010, the war in Afghanistan has been going on for nine years. In the previous year, when Barack Obama was running for president, he had actually run during his campaign by stating that, as opposed to the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan was a war of necessity, not a war of choice, going back to the 
attacks on the World Trade Center and Pentagon in 2001. So shortly after coming into office, uh, the president had overseen the deployment of 21,000 additional uh, soldiers and Marines to theater in March 2009. And in December 2009, he announced plans to deploy another 30,000 troops to Afghanistan. At the time, a lot of folks in the Pentagon were suggesting that it would, this was great. It's finally time that the army has taken off the gloves, right? And to what David was speaking about a little bit ago, not just uh, uh, pussyfoot around a little bit, but to actually you know, land that knockout blow that you can really get the Taliban to abandon the battlefield and achieve this decisive victory. So with that being said, one of the, and, and I won't weigh the audience down in a lot of the details in the background, but one of the places that was chosen in the country to go out and, and really be the tip of the spear, so to speak, for the surge was Zari district in Kandahar province in Southern Afghanistan. And Zari was chosen for a couple of reasons. The first of which it is that it borders uh, Kandahar City, which is Afghanistan's second largest city and of some, oh, I don't know, 700,000 to a million residents. So it's very important in terms of the population density there. But secondly, because of kind of, it has the symbolic nature in being the birthplace of the Taliban. Zari district is where Mullah Omar in 1994 had um, really started to confront a lot of the out of control warlordism uh, in, in southern Afghanistan and eventually marched on Kandahar City and then Kabul, Kabul. So this is the birthplace of the Taliban. This is their backyard. And it's also um, the Pashtun heartland of Afghanistan. The Taliban draws most, the vast majority of its recruits and it is a movement that's based with Pashtuns. And so really over nine years of warfare, uh, NATO, the United States, and at the time ISAF had not prioritized the clearance of the Taliban from Zari district, with the exception perhaps of Operation Medusa, a Canadian led effort in 2006. But by, by the time we get to 2010, um, this is again the main effort of the surge and the, it's also getting to the part of being one of the initial efforts of finding an exit strategy from this war. When Obama had uh, deployed these extra soldiers, and you can read about this in Robert Gates' duty, it was always going to be a temporary thing. These soldiers were only, these extra soldiers, Marines were only going to be there until late 2011. So you could put pressure, so to speak, on the Taliban by driving them from their traditional uh, homelands, keeping pressure up on them so that there was time to train the Afghan National Army so that the ANA would be able to take the lead on the battlefield. Because in any counterinsurgency or imperial policing venture, the exit strategy always hinges on developing cooperating local allies who are able to take up the fight against the insurgents or or whoever your adversary is at the end. And so that is kind of the logic behind all of this. Um, by the time Maquan comes around, it becomes the opening act of Operation Dragon Strike, which is, as I mentioned earlier, the Army's largest operation of the war. It is conducted uh, primarily by the 2nd Brigade 101st Airborne Division with elements from uh, Marine Corps units. Um, you also have Navy Seabees. You have elements from the 3rd Brigade of the 101st Airborne Division and many other elements that are involved in this, about 8,000 soldiers total. And one of the things, again, that I'm, I really liked about this um, battle is just the high degree of the alienation and foreignness of fighting an intercultural war, because not only are the Americans going in to Makwan to seize this strategically located village on the outskirts of Kandahar city, but they're also going in to seize this village along with Afghan National Army allies. So the foreignness of the conflict in the battle is visceral, not in the sense that your enemy is fighting a different way than you're used to, in terms of the high degree of IEDs, in terms of never meeting you on the battlefield, trying to use small arm fires to lure you into IED traps, but also you have the, the alien nature and foreignness of fighting along an adversary 
that um, really doesn't want to be there in many regards. And the American soldiers really don't like the Afghans that are fighting alongside of them for a number of reasons that uh, maybe we can go into later if, if folks want to. But so this is very dislocating and jarring for the experience of the Americans. And ultimately, the clearance of Maquan, the Americans go in in a very conventional breaching operation. They reach the village and then they essentially encounter a village that has been abandoned. It's only used by the Taliban. Uh, there are no civilians around. It's eerie. There's no one there but there's IEDs all over the place. And uh, during the clearance of this village, you start to have, the Americans start to have a steady drip of casualties between both their Afghan partners and the Americans as they're triggering IEDs that kind of exact a slow, steady bleed of wounded. And getting back to what David said, um, in a lot of these conflicts where uh, where we talk about memory, we haven't talked about historic memory a lot, but that's really at the heart of this book as well, what we choose to remember and what we ultimately choose to forget. And one of the things I think that's really fascinating uh, about this particular battle is that um, in, in terms of forgetting, we often forget that, of course, individuals who can't fight in a rest westernized industrial way that don't want to meet us on the battlefield because they'd be annihilated, choose to attack our will, our political will, uh, as opposed to just um, uh, our, our forces, so to speak. So that's another great lesson of this. And ultimately, um, folks will have to read the book to see the ultimate income outcome of the battle. But in the end, I could make the argument that both sides could claim victory both sides, you could make an argument, could claim defeat, whether tactically, strategically, or whatever. It really depends on the time frame and, and the objectives to which you ascribe to both of the belligerents, whether tactically, operationally, or strategically. So in that regard, the ambiguity of outcome is something that's very fascinating as well. Thank you very much. Wayne, go ahead. Yeah, John, I, I wanted to partly referenced in this joking way, but in a serious way, one of the things you said to Tony about me not telling him what to write. Um, I, I do want to emphasize for those people who haven't read the book yet, that one of the things we did, one of the things we call ourselves the co-authors rather than, it's, it's not a collection of essays about these three different battles. We, we very carefully structured the book to do the same things in each battle chapter, to ask the same questions, to tell the story in a similar way along a similar set of trajectories, and then to use Keegan's model of paired combatants. And I'm anticipating slightly here one of the questions that's already in the question box about Miklix, uh, because one of the paired combatants that Tony details is the Miklix, that is to say mine clearing line charges used normally to destroy or open uh, breaches in Soviet era minefields are being used by American forces to clear through belts of IEDs. So it's Miklix versus IEDs. As a paired combatant, as, a, as an unexpected consequence of this intercultural and in this case also asymmetric context. Uh, and so that even though we have an American culture on American, an Anglo-American culture on one side, at least for all three, We've got Native Americans, uh, Filipinos, and uh, Afghan Taliban on the other. So we've got many more variables to deal with than Keegan did. And, but that paired combatant mechanism is something designed to allow us to get deep inside the minds and perspectives and perceptions of the people involved. What is it like, asked Keegan, when an infantryman is run at by a man on a horse? And we asked the question, what is it like for an American soldier to explode a Miklik in a belt of IEDs? How do they experience that? And that included me, ask, again, directing Tony. I said, when I read his draft, I said, hey, what's the overpressure effect of a Miklik going off on someone who's laying on the ground 50 yards away? Like, let's do some research on that. What does that feel like? Uh, that's how a Miklik works. It creates an overpressure wave that sets off the detonating uh, triggers on, on the mines. And so that's that pairing combatants mechanism allows us to explore those experiences in greater detail. And, and speaking of how the book was written, Wayne, I, I remember texting you uh, several weeks ago and I just started reading the book saying, did everybody work on each chapter 
because the way the book reads, and this is mostly for our audience, it's uh, to hope, hope that they read this, it really is a seamless narrative. And it does sound like everybody was in one voice, very impressive uh, to say the least. So um, now let me ask this to all of you. Um, when you pick three battles, you're always gonna get somebody who's, who's gonna say, oh, why didn't you pick this one? Or how come not this one? And uh, at the risk of sounding too much like that, but and not as a criticism, but would any of the any of the battles from Vietnam fit this mold? Also, um, that's kind of the first. Once I put it down, I, I and I'm not a Vietnam War military historian, but um, what what do you think about the Vietnam War struggle or some of the battles there? Would they fit into this uh, framework? Uh Absolutely. I'll start by answering that question and anybody else who wants to chime in too can. And we spent a lot of time talking about whether to do a fourth case study and the fourth case study would absolutely have been from Vietnam. Um, and it partly was a matter of aesthetic balance. Do we do four? Do we do three? Um, and what we ended up deciding to do was, you know, because we wanted the book to be a certain length. We wanted the book to have a certain kind of appeal. Uh, and we, we did so we did two things. One, we decided that Vietnam has been far more well covered than any of the other conflicts that we look at uh, by existing histories. And the second thing we did was I spent a lot of time writing in the interlude chapters. Again, for those who haven't read the book, between each of the case studies, there are what we call interlude chapters that sort of guide the reader through the changes in mobilization process in the United States, changes in military technology over the intervening period. So the intervening period between uh, Monongahela and Manila, Manila and Makwan, and also the, the intervening experience of wars. That is that is to say, what, what, what kind of a wars had America been fighting during these intervening periods and how they responded to that. And also diving into the, uh, into the forgetting, which is a, a theme that we have just only briefly touched on so far. That is the forgetting of the lessons of those previous conflicts. And so I spent a lot of time in the interlude trying to lay out what the American experience of Vietnam had been uh, in very brief format. And I could do that in part because so much work has been done on Vietnam and I could lean on the work of so many other scholars in trying to summarize uh, what had happened in Vietnam. But any number of battles from Vietnam could have been picked um, to fulfill a similar role. Anyone else? All right, let's move to, uh, we got some good questions in the upper here. Uh, and this one is directed to all four of you. What are the con continuities between the three battles uh, that are valuable for army senior leaders as they contemplate the doctrine and training of the 21st century force? David Sibley. Um. Yeah, I think one of the things that's a continuity is the way in which battles and wars and conflicts are shaped as much as by both sides perception of what's going on as what's actually going on. So I think David Preston highlighted that with how the British experienced what happened at Monagahela. And I highlighted that with what was going on in Manila and, and Tony highlighted that with what was going on with Makwan. But one of the things you want to be careful about is not getting not getting confused into thinking that what you see happening is actually what's happening, because the lessons you're going to learn from what you think is going on are dip, might be different from what you what is actually going on. And 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 just to sort of you know steal my own example is the American Army after Manila thought it understood the Filipinos and understood how they, what they could do and how they could react. And they were wrong because they were basing that on what they perceived about the Filipinos rather than what, who the Filipinos actually were. And so there's that difference between perception and actuality that I think is, is common through all of our work and is still important today. Understanding, to, to steal something from Wayne, understanding what the Afghans think about what's going on and what they're understanding about the war is important to understanding what's actually going on and what we're doing and it's not necessarily something we've dealt with. Wayne? Yeah, one of the things we, in the conclusion, uh, we identify several themes that run across all, all of the examples. 
And I, I want to highlight two of them. Um, and that is in terms of the strategic importance in the question, the way the question was asked about what, what, what should leaders be thinking about? And that is the tendency to be dismissive of the other, the intercultural opponent or the intercultural ally, the, the tendency to underestimate their capacities, um, whether technological, military, or uh, uh, persistence. And in line with that, or oxymoronically attached to that dismissiveness is dependence. Because ultimately in each case, the American success or not would hinge upon their ability to rally or motivate or mobilize that same other to serve American interests or their own interests. But the, the, ultimately the strategic objective would be dependent upon the willingness of that, inner, of that other in whatever role to do fulfill some role, whether it's the Philippine scouts or the Philippine constabulary or allied Indians in the 18th century or the ANA in the 21st century, that ultimately the strategic objective would be dependent upon those, those others of whom Americans were naturally tended to be dismissive. And therefore the, the whole strategic narrative has to be from the beginning to eliminate that tendency to be dismissive because ultimately you will be dependent on them. I'll, I'll amplify some of Wayne's remarks there. I think um, in, in all three of our case studies, we see some of the dangers of escalation, un, unexpected escalation as a result of um, these various interventions or, or battles that we're discussing. In the case of, of um, Monongahela, this was a, an extremely limited uh, objective that uh, that Braddock had is simply capturing a, a French fort, but the the destruction of his of his army led to a, a, a far greater escalation of this regional conflict, and it soon became a, a global conflict that really defined the the future of the of the world, um, and that was certainly not a that wasn't in the that wasn't in the on the radar screen of the of the British ministers who designed this this expedition in 1755, um, and I think in the in the same way Manila is illustrative of, of that dynamic that the the Americans expected this this um, this conventional triumph and instead they got a a, a very long very long insurgency. Thank you. Uh, I have another question here from one of our audience members. Uh, in comparing the battles studied, uh, or even the ones that you thought about um, that aren't in the book, did you find any impact of having a commander in chief who has had military experience versus those who have not, either in the decision making process or the rallying of the American public? Well, there's, first of all, there's no real commander in chief at Monongahela, and it's not in the same way. Um, and the distance of the commander in chief from the from Manila uh, pr pr provides an enormous strategic gap in terms of the outcome of that battle. But as a more general rule, I would say that our focus is experiential first and foremost. Is what are the soldiers' experience? And if there's anything a soldier will immediately tell you when you ask about their experience, is that I don't care who the president is. I don't care who my brigade commander is. I certainly don't care who the division or the corps commander is. That does not affect my experience at all. Uh, what I care about is what is my sergeant doing? What is my platoon leader doing? Maybe what my company commander doing? What above all else? What is my air traffic uh, or my uh, my my uh, tactical uh, forward air controller doing? Uh, you know, those are the guys I care about in terms of my experience on the battlefield. So I'm, I'm not sure that, that we could talk very well or very clearly about the sinks effect on the soldier's experience. David? I did, I did want to highlight something about experience. I think, Wayne, I think you're absolutely right. I, uh, I do want to highlight something about experience, which is that the sort of uh, lived memory of the folks engaged in certain conflicts or battles sometimes I think has an effect. And I'm thinking about Manila, particularly where the, the sort of lived experience for a lot of them was the civil war 
um, whether it was the generals or McKinley, who had President McKinley, who had served in the in the Civil War, and has my my favorite monument of all time at Antietam, which is to him serving coffee and donuts to the frontline troops um, uh, as a as a quartermaster sergeant. But I think that that in some ways the war that everyone remembers or has experienced does have an effect. So when when uh, when McKinley comes in, it's the Civil War. When Obama comes in in 2010, it's sort of Vietnam, but also the first Gulf War. And so there's this sort of sense of what's the public memory, the public experience uh, of the war that everybody's looking back to that has some effect. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't think the, the, the there's any difference between president's military experience, the greatest war leader of our of our time of American history is Lincoln, who had no real military experience at all. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I see a difference between those two. Okay. Okay, we probably have time for one last question. A um, mutual friend of all five of us has has asked an impossibly long question but uh, in deference to him and my, my association with him going back many years, I will read it because it's a good question. <clears throat> uh, the US Army's ongoing shift to large scale combat operations suggests that it's following a long established pattern of eschewing wars it prefers not fighting in favor of preparing for the types of war it wants to fight when the actual experience suggests otherwise. Uh, after finishing this book, how do you reconcile the actuality of the past with the desires of the army? Would you mind elaborating? What great, great question from our friend. Anybody want to take that one first? I, I think I should let Anthony answer most of that question because okay. he's, he's the most irritated about this. <laughs> um, but uh, I think it's something we try to document in the conclusion of the book and in the last few pages of, of Tony's chapter uh, that the in the present that the army is turning away from the lessons of, of the counterinsurgency experiences in, in Afghanistan and, and Iraq and I don't think anybody would question that that is clearly what's happening institutionally uh, whether that turning away is is right wrong or indifferent is something for other people to judge but let me let Tony take part of this one Sure. Well, I, I think our uh, questioner, John, has uh, been to my uh, class and heard me uh, um, fulminate once or twice uh, in, uh, in, in the recent past. But yeah, I think it's a very interesting question. And without, um, for, for me, becoming you know, too opinionated or didactic, I, I think I would just say that I'm a historian. And being a historian, um, I, I very much recognize that the past is always in the dialogue with the present. And because of that, uh, I, I think that the, the that the past should help us plan for the future in a better way um, than if we had ignored it. I mean, that is ultimately what it means to be historically minded is to understand that things aren't today as they are for some inevitable reason, but because of past contingent decisions that people have made. And I feel that what the current institution is doing is choosing a path, maybe not of uh, forgetting the recent examples of counterinsurgency, non-state warfare in the most recent, uh, um, in the last two decades, but what it's doing is preparing for the familiar rather than the likely. And from our perspective, it's preparing for the familiar because the familiar is culturally something that is that we're comfortable with. When we think about near peer competition, folks that perhaps have the same level of technology, understanding of victory defeat that we do, um, there's a certain comfort level in that. But when you start to add in all sorts of different variables and actors, um, fighting alongside an indigenous partner as opposed to fighting an intercultural other, uh, then it becomes much more messy and messy in a way that a lot of our planning processes such as MDMP, JPP, I don't do think do a very good job of capturing. So um, I'm, I'm very concerned about the institution moving too quickly away from the lessons of the recent past as it did in the direct aftermath of Vietnam. 
And I'm hopeful to some degree that this book can at least challenge some of our senior leaders and policymakers to understand that, um, you know, hey, the, the past, yes, is a foreign land, but we need to continue to vicariously enlarge our own experience by engaging with the normative experience of the institution of the army, whether, rather than those very anomalous affairs such as World War II, World War I, the Civil War, that produced these nice, clean outcomes because clean outcomes are the anomaly. Messiness is the norm. Okay, David Silby. When uh, when we when something like that was posted about what we were talking about on uh, on social media, one of the responses talked about how when you need to focus on conventional warfare, you can take the intercultural stuff and put it on a shelf until you need it and then pull it down and relearn it on the fly. And I think that sort of states exactly what Tony is talking about, which is that there's an institutional sense that we don't need to pay attention to this until we do do, and then it's probably too late. Thank you all very much. Wayne Lee, David Silby, Tony Carlson, David Preston, authors of the, or, the Other Face of Battle, America's Forgotten Wars, The Experience of Combat. Can't thank you all enough for being here with us tonight. Thank you.